think we're going to go ahead and start this uh, webinar. Uh, hello and welcome everyone to the Upper Midwest Telehealth Resource Center educational webinar series. Today we have the topic of evolution of telebehavioral health program at a critical access hospital and it will be presented by Stephanie Laws. She is the executive director at the Rural Health Innovation Collaborative and she also serves as a clinical coordinator for the Upper Midwest Telehealth Resource Center. With us, we also have Becky Sanders, the Program Director for the Upper Midwest Telehealth Resource Center. She'll be moderating the question and answer session. Before I hand it over to Stephanie, just a few things. Uh, you can participate in this webinar using the Q&A section. You can tap on it and you can write your comments or questions. You can do it throughout the webinar, but I recommend just saving it till the end when Stephanie is done. We will have plenty of times for question and answers. So without further ado, uh, I would hand it over to Stephanie. Go ahead, Stephanie. Thank you, Amna, and thank you, Becky, for this opportunity. I'm going to be clicking over to share my screen with all of you so that you can follow along during the presentation. Okay, is it gonna go to the full screen mode there? There we go. All right, so thank you everybody for taking time out of your busy Monday schedules and learning about the evolution of telebehavioral health programs in critical access hospitals. Again, I'm Stephanie Laws, the Executive Director of the Rural Health Innovation Collaborative, but also the Principal Investigator for a grant that has uh, largely funded these initiatives that we will be talking about um, during this session. Again, I just want to start off um, with a disclosure that um, this program that I will be talking about today and all of the data therein is supported by the Health Resources and Services Administration's Office for Rural Health, Office for Advancement of Telehealth from the Department of Health and Human Services. Its contents are solely the responsibility of the authors, myself included, and do not necessarily represent the official views of the Department of Health and human services. So with that being um, out of the way, <clears throat> we're gonna take a little bit of time this afternoon just to kind of shape up the landscape um, and talk about how did we get from there to here. Some of you who may know me or may not know me, um, I started out at a critical access hospital working in Clinton, Indiana. Um, soon after um, I graduated from nursing school in 1998. And I was able to be in that community and that critical access hospital until I took um, a new role down here as my current role in 2008. And during that time, we saw a lot of transition and a lot of change that came about. When I was in the emergency department and we would have a patient that would come in that had um, suicidal ideations or behavioral tendencies, we were able to call our community mental health center partner, which was Hamilton Center, and they would send a behavioral health consultant physically to our location. And then collaboratively, a decision was made and a disposition plan was created for that patient. And uh, all seemingly went well with that process. And then in 2006, there was a uh, shortfall of funding and that threatened to remove the capacity and the ability in that workforce from a behavioral health perspective to come and provide those behavioral health consults for patients who were coming in with a variety of behavioral health and mental health disorders to the ER. And so we really struggled with that after we were not able to get a face-to-face -face consult with these individuals. Sometimes seeing their length of stay in the emergency department exponentially skyrocketing into up to 16 hours. Um, and it was not therapeutic. And at the end of the day, as you learn more about me and my style of leadership and clinical administration, at the epicenter of every decision we make, needs to be wholeheartedly about the patient. So coming from my background and then in 2007, looking at alternative strategies of care, which will then lead us down this pathway of telehealth, 
But I just want to share for the broader audience that compared with physically or medically ill patients, people with behavioral health conditions rely more on the emergency department for treatment and are often admitted to the hospital from the ER, thereby creating a safety net of the safety net. What do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is that when we have rural communities, the critical access hospital emergency department is usually the only 24 seven available access to healthcare around, or perhaps a more urban based hospital, um, in our case, in our region, Union Hospital or Regional Hospital here in Terre Haute. And so these patients oftentimes are not um, afforded opportunities to qualify through their, their payers to go to outpatient um, counseling, outpatient substance abusing programs. And we all can relate that there is a national shortage of behavioral health care providers, outpatient treatment programs, inpatient psychiatric creds, it's all contributing to part of this problem. And again, the only true 24-7, 365 access is that emergency department. Right, wrong, or indifferent, the patients will come. Just to kind of fold this in to more of the equation, you have busy emergency rooms, both in the tertiary care centers here in Terre Haute, but out in the critical access hospital, busy necessarily isn't to mean volumes. It means resources maximize the potential of what available um, services can be made to these patients. So for example, in an emergency room in a critical access hospital, you may have one registered nurse with a support staff, depending on the time or the day of the week. You may have two registered nurses. Say you're forced to have two registered nurses. Well, what happens when you have a behavioral health patient and then you get that car accident that came in down the street and then you had a couple other medical patients come in and then you have another nursing home patient comes in and you can quickly see how resources become extremely strapped for really taking the best care of patients who may need extra sets of hands, even though they're not coming in in our typical emergency room state of mind of breathing difficulties and bleeding control issues. These patients seemingly look fine, but they may pose some of the greatest risk to our staff, to our patient, other patients, and to the community. And for that reason, you know, some of our creditors and our regulators say that we need to have at least training around behavioral health disorders, but the specificity of what consists in that training is very loose and nondescript. But ER personnel do lack the specialized training and skills to effectively care for behavioral health patients. Um, I think that sometimes we get a little bit complacent, you know, maybe we're not searching the pocket to make sure that they don't have a knife or some lighter or, you know, we all see the drama of our TV ER shows. But in reality, these things can happen if we let down our guard. And as I said, the ER is so often chaotic with limited resources, creating safety issues, both for the patients and staff. And I think that for some of us, and not to be stereotypical, but sometimes these behavioral health patients consume more resources than those that are physically or medically ill, longer length of stay, sometimes one-on-one -on -one observation because of posing elopement risks, um, other types of safety issues, um, environmental concerns. And so they just really, the, the behavioral health issues and the emergency department just really lend themselves to a melting pot of um, higher level of awareness and chaos management. But as this layer started funding of lack of resources from a behavioral health perspective, um, you know, the training and the education in the emergency department, the access and availability uh, afforded to by a critical access hospital or emergency department for patients to come. We had those operational budget cuts, like I said, where the behavioral health specialist couldn't come anymore to the critical access accessible site. That's really what we started pushing down to start getting telehealth, which we'll talk about here, because we had profound throughput issues 
And at the end of the day, the patient, the patient was not getting the care that they needed when they needed the care. Their access and availability to care was being dictated by when potentially a provider could come and deliver that. So let's just take a Labor Day weekend, for example. And for those of you who know Clinton, Indiana, and have any experience with the Critical Access Hospital, let me give you an example of Labor Day weekend. There is what's known as the Little Italy Festival that kicks off on that Friday of Labor Day weekend and runs through and concludes up on Monday night. So if we have a patient in need of a behavioral health consult that would have come in the hospital on a Friday night and say that patient was from Park County, which Hamilton Center also had a site in Park County as well as Vermilion County, and depending on that patient's zip code, which dictate which county our consult services would have come from, the patient could have remained in that hospital because nobody was coming on the weekends, of course. That patient could have had a Friday night, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and perhaps we would get a consult on Tuesday. Not therapeutic for the patients, not efficacious for the staff, not good steward for uh, whatever payer source that patient had. But the largest payer mix, um, obviously, that we were looking at was Medicaid, followed by those with no identified payer source, and then Medicare, Medicaid, or dual enrollment. So we just had a lot of resource management issues that forced us down the path of telemedicine. So we conducted a needs assessment among senior leaders. And we indicated that the integration of telemedicine to help solve the multifaceted behavioral health issues they were facing, every single critical access hospital said this was their number one priority. And because critical access are often the largest employer in the rural community, many of the critical access hospitals within this region are in some of Indiana's most economically distressed counties, which means not only are they economically distressed, but when we look at clinical um, outcomes data, health outcomes data through county health rankings and other types of sites, we found, find that we have high premature death, we have other types of factors that contribute to shorter lives. We have a lot of high risk uh, behavior issues that occur in these communities, smoking, uh, not to mention the epidemic of substance abuse and the opiate crisis that we're currently facing. But uh, there's a lot that has just been amplified in terms of the community and our socio demographic and economic layers um, that still are highly relevant but we were charged to create that end-to-end -end telehealth solution to solve basic operation and disposition issues. With anything, you have to think about the end and the beginning, okay? So that involves a lot of partner meetings uh, among behavioral health providers, community mental health centers, critical access hospitals. It's all in, all hands on deck because we cannot solve these issues in a silo. It will not happen. We had to think about privileging and credentialing of providers at each site. We had to think about the design, the development, and education of clinical workflows, algorithms, policies, procedures. And with the behavioral health population, truthfully, inclusion and exclusion criteria. When was it too much to have a blood alcohol level at a certain level and adequately and, and, and appropriately? Um, conduct oneself in a behavioral health consult. So we had to set those hard control limits for patients. Um, now we have a lot of um, toxicology results that have to be taken into consideration. We have to take cognitive impairment. With the aging population, are they able to hear well? Are they able to see well? Will it be a therapeutic response? And at the end of the day, we just want to make sure that we have enough protections in there for the patients as well as the care providers who are, are injected into this clinical paradigm with the patient to make them successful. And then obviously the endpoint technology education and integration because telehealth is not a replacement. It's a tool, just like you would use a stethoscope or a Dynamat blood pressure cuff or anything else in that clinical design of that workflow.
it helps inform and it helps us make decisions based on the results that we get. And then obviously, we wanted to design, develop, and educate our patients. And we also wanted to make sure that our providers had continual opportunities for feedback. And then data, data, data. And God we trust, but everybody else, you need to bring data because we need to understand from a quality and review perspective, plan, do, check, act. How do we know that what we're doing isn't inflicting harm? Because that's our oath, first do no harm. But we want to make sure that we're making these hospitals to be rich with opportunity to handle patients more efficaciously and effectively. So as part of our evidence-based teleemergency network grant program, each site that is participating in the telebehavioral health arm of our study has an inventory for teleemergency care or ITEC, this is the patient version, informed consent volunteer hospital survey that is completed. And that just goes along with our institutional review board approval for this particular project. So everybody's informed. We have, you've heard me say, Wabash Valley Rural Telehealth Network. Well, where exactly in the world is that? So for the behavioral health perspective, we have recipients at Union Clinton, Greene County General Hospital, Sullivan County Community Hospital, Putnam County Hospital, and then our behavioral health providers within our region are Hamilton Center and Union Hospital's Behavioral Health Department. So just to kind of give you an idea among these sites here, just for this particular grant, we see about 500 cases per year just for behavioral health. But the Wabash Valley Rural Telehealth Network, if you would like to get onto our website, which I have contact information before, we have many other specialties besides behavioral health that are being conducted in not only Indiana, but Illinois um, as well. So, and we've just brought up two sites for neuro in Southern Illinois, as well as uh, Vincent's Good Samaritan, and soon to bring up um, two um, sites, one in Southern Indiana, one in Northern Kentucky. So in the spectrum of the network, it's growing bigger and bigger and bigger, and our specialties are becoming more diverse to meet the patient's needs. We are committed to say that geography should not dictate the availability of care that a resident should receive in their home communities. So from a patient perspective, from early data analysis from our grant, we have found that the patient perceptions are, are pretty healthy, that 47% of our patients would highly, uh, extremely likely recommend this to others. Um, some of the qualitative feedback that we're getting from those surveys indicate that, um, you know, it was accessible, uh, that it was um, available, that it was um, much better than having to come in and, and continuously wait. Um, but interestingly, when comparing, say, behavioral health patient perceptions comparatively to the neuro uh, patient perceptions, patients with the neurological evaluations uh, ranked even extremely likely to recommend um, much, much higher than those with behavioral health conditions. And we can um, talk about that a little later about why um, the patient's perceptions differ between certain um, disease states as well as diagnoses and reasons for consultation. So you can see 69% um, were pretty happy to recommend um, telehealth services. So this really gets down to the meat and the potatoes of, you know, why do we do what we want to do with this telehealth, you know, and Again, it's about getting the patient the right care that they need at the time they need to receive it, not being dictated by what resource can be available and when. So I told you of some of the struggles that we specifically faced at Union Clinton pre-implementation. And we found that sometimes 
I said, you know, these patients were staying up to 16 hours in the emergency department. And, you know, after we implemented, implemented that at Clinton, that length of stay came down to 240, which was just about in alignment um, with, with all um, other patient and their, their, their diagnosis causes. So the total time spent in ED per minutes, and this was, um, you can see the sample size here, um, pulled out some data to be able to share with all of you today, that we can see from the time that that patient was triaged to discharge from the ED was 287.5 minutes. It's not too shabby for a behavioral health patient. And that standard deviation was plus or minus 147.9. <clears throat> A telehealth visit was on average about 33 of those minutes for the time, the assessment uh, to consult and then provide and relay back information to the attending at the critical access hospital site. And I wanna point out that this does, does not mean that this is only Clinton's data. This, these are data points for the site that I told you, Green, Sullivan, Putnam, and Clinton. So there you can see that it was just about four hours and 15 minutes uh, in total. But for those of you, of you who may be attending that are on the emergency side of the clinical medicine, um, we can be waiting at least that long alone sometimes if we're trying to find a bed for an inpatient uh, acute psychiatric patient. So we felt that this was very favorable in terms of the efficacy and efficiencies created by having access via telemedicine. So we wanted to also assess the providers and say, well, did telehealth influence your disposition decision? Did you feel like before you got the consult, you were leaning, this patient is going to be admitted or this patient's gonna be discharged or transferred. Did How did the telehealth um, impact your disposition? Did it change your disposition? And so we had um, one was highly probable and five was extremely, so one, highly improbable, five, extremely probable, intend to transfer prior to telehealth consultation. And you can see where the distribution is that physicians and providers said that transfer of patients um, might have been, let's see, it looks like highly improbable down here in this one and two spectrum, but they're in the middle. They were really undecided, so they really didn't know what to do with that patient um, prior to getting the consult. So you can see that at the lower end of the spectrum, combined 40%, upper end of the spectrum and the extremely probables, 23%, but right there in the middle, 36.4%. So if we take three and below, the majority of our physicians that we pulled, pulled as part of this particular arm of the study really didn't know what the disposition should be for these patients until the consult was obtained via telemedicine. And that was for all diagnoses. And then this was specifically for the telehealth. Did the telehealth influence patient disposition slash transfer for these behavioral health patients? And look, yes, yes it did influence the patient disposition. 61.8% of the time, it was highly, extremely probable that it did. And then again, 21.8% right down the middle lane there. This slide is a little bit hard to see um, in terms of the overall graphics, but this is just demonstrating um, the responses of what it meant to the patients in terms of admissions and transfers, because we know sometimes transfers are unavoidable, but it also creates hardship and burden on families um, and, and their um, 
immediate family members and, and, and other loved ones to transfer to other sites. And sometimes with a behavioral health bed, we may be looking as far as three hours away from our region um, to find a bed uh, for a patient to go to. And preliminarily, um, we have also reviewed, um, collected um, our ICD-9, ICD-10 codes, actually it's ICD-9, because we took and completed a cross cohort, um, cro a cross match analysis across the cohort. So we looked at the time that the patient, at the time the organization went live with telehealth, and then we went back before telehealth was implemented and we matched the cases comparatively to those that received telehealth interventions after implementation so that we could have a good mix of, of gender, age, demography, and code aspects. And we're finding that the highest cost of care in the telebehavioral health realm to organizations patients, payers, is that involving patients coming to the ER with substance abuse disorders. I will have more to share regarding our findings on that front as we continue to run some correlations and some matches with those patients just to make sure that we can make those generalizations. Um, but that is what we're seeing in terms of the cost of care. And I was also preliminarily very um, interested to see that the cohort with behavioral health conditions had a shorter length of stay in the ED than those with neurological conditions, which is something I would not have guessed on just the outright analysis. So our research team is going back and rolling up their sleeves and doing some more correlations that I've asked for. But at the end of the day, our next steps is just to continue to improve patient outcomes making sure these patients get the right care at the right time and it's the right point. We have to work smarter, not harder. And we also need to make sure that we're helping to sustain rural healthcare facilities. As we continue to look where costs can be neutralized or reduced with a telehealth visit, I think it's equally important. And maybe for those of you who are on the line, I don't know, um, but Anthem just issued uh, a notice that as of September 1st, um, Anthem will decline and deny payment for emergency room visits um, when that patient has access to convenient care and that uh, emergency room visit was not pre-authorized. And so we also know that on a national scale that the health care is going to continue to be under the magnifying glass of some, some reform. Uh, we've looked at skinny repeal, which didn't go through, but at some point we know that over the course of the past five years and the expansion of Medicaid, there's going to be some retraction back to the states as we look at sustainability of state dollars and Medicaid that there's going to be some reduction in those populations and those pools of beneficiaries that are that are currently under the Medicaid expansion. So what does that mean? It just means again we need to work smarter, not harder. Make sure we're always doing the right thing for the patient at the time of presentation. Um, and the other piece is is that when these patients are coming to the emergency department. And for anybody who has worked in the emergency department, we see cyclical cases. Patients who come, maybe super utilize our system because it is their primary point of access to care in that community. And, you know, we really have to decrease the fragmentation, but the fragmentation is largely due to a lack of alternate outpatient based treatment options to help provide that social epicenter to navigate that patient towards resource, resource attainment and everything that they need to be more successful in lieu of just accessing emergency rooms for behavioral health conditions. And then ultimately, you know, my stewardship to all of you is to continue as we 
go through the maturation of this particular grant, the evidence-based uh, tele-emergency network grant, is to share data, share outcomes, disseminate these opportunities with you and other FERSA um, folks, because we can only make better choices for our patients and inform decisions for our patients if we know quantifiably how those uh, systems of care will react, what is the organizational behavior that, that led to a positive adoption of the technology, and how did we clinically integrate it. And again, like I said, telehealth is a tool, just like a blood pressure cuff, just like you know, you're know, you wearing your stethoscope around your neck, it doesn't replace care. It allows you to make better decisions for your patient based on the information you receive. The information you receive just happens to come from a trained consultant who is on the other end of the, the, uh, the uh, video conference that is interviewing the patient, collecting assessment data, and then providing the consultative report back to the attending at the critical access hospital site. So with that being said, um, I want to give you my contact information, which is my email there, and also one of my colleagues here, Hisham Rahmouni um, at the Luger Center, that is uh, a co um, uh, co colleague of mine that works in this space with me and helps me with uh, grants management. So with that being said, I will stop share and hopefully we can open that up for uh, questions and some thoughts. And I just wanted to make this um, more dynamic <coughs> if, if we would like to um, and go from there. All right, so as we mentioned earlier, we're gonna go ahead and go into our Q&A portion now. So if you will use the um, Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, go ahead and start sending in questions for us. Does nobody have any questions? I Maybe they're just not typing fast enough. I don't know, you must have explained everything perfectly. I don't think I did. So let me see here. Let me, let me see if I have a participant that I can kind of show. So Mary Addison, I think is on the line and I think that she probably was able to resonate um, some of the topics that I was um, discussing earlier today. And, um, Maybe she has a question or two that we can uh, attach. Yeah, I thought the I'm familiar with I'm familiar with the um, Italy, Italy Festival in Clinton. I've actually attended that festival several times, and that's uh, a wonderful example of a perfect storm in a behavioral health setting. <laughs> So would we get a question? Do we answer it? We do, do I just repeat it and then say the answer or do I just type it back? How do you guys handle well, that? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it out loud. Okay. And then I'm, what I'll have you do is answer it live so that everybody can hear even if they haven't seen the question. Okay. So our first question, <clears throat> have you had any challenges with credentialing of providers? Always a good one. Well, the credentialing of the providers is always a, depending on the organization, a challenge, but I can tell you that what's unique about this system is that we work with multiple independent organizations, in this case, critical access hospitals in and around our region to administer this project. So we don't have the ability to credential everybody, say, at Union Health, and then then have them credentialed based on that uh, standard out in these other facilities. Each facility goes through each provider with their own packets of papers that they have to have for their conditions of participation, rules, regs, and bylaws, and credentials and privileges, each provider that will provide the consultation services. And that is both for behavioral health, neuro, and any other type of consultant that we have coming into their facility, just as if it was a person coming in face-to-face. -face. So not to think too outside the box here, but the radiologists have really figured all this out for years. So teleradiology and offsite reads, those 
radiologists have to be privileged and credentialed at all of those facilities to be able to get that done. This is kind of in that same sweeping motion that um, because we're not one large health system, everybody has to go it on their own. And so it does take a time, um, take time to get through that. And when you're dealing with other specialties, and getting licensure in additional states, there are even further setbacks um, in that design. But I can tell you from a rules and regulatory perspective, the CMS and the joint accreditation, uh, the joint commission require specific language within those contracts that you maintain a list of current providers. How do you maintain that list? How do you communicate the list? Um, and then how do you have assurance that they will be um, be uh, compliant with the conditions of participation as outlined by Medicaid or Medicare. Mm -hmm. So we ha <clears throat> have another question. How would you suggest we start finding hospitals like yours who might be interested in using telehealth? So as part of the evidence-based teleemergency services network grant, there are five other grantees in the nation besides this particular one. There is our grant with Union Health, and then we have the University of Kentucky Medical Center. We have the University of Virginia, UC Davis Sacramento, St. Vincent's Billings, Montana, and then we also have uh, a Vera Health System in South Dakota. All of us have our own local research strategies, and in our case, we partnered with Indiana State University Epidemiology and Healthcare Researchers. But then we also have a unified tool that we collect on our telehealth cases that we contribute up to the national, one of the national telehealth research centers at the University of Iowa. And so I am sure that there are other um, organizations that may be not grant funded that are doing their own telehealth based research or efficacy and efficiency and effectiveness design studies. And I would say that your telehealth resource centers within that region, Becky and Omna, can uh, can point you in the directions to those. I know they work very collaboratively with those resource center directors. Thank you. Um, we have another question asking about the list of criteria outlined by Medicare. If you wanna shoot us a URL, we can share that with the attendees. So the list of Medicare criteria for billing or what are we talking about? I think that we are talking about the credentialing piece, I think. I'm going to... Oh, I have a couple of PDF for the Joint Commission as well as CMS that I can send along with the uh, PowerPoint slides that Omna will be able to send out to the group participants today. But there is, you'll see some of my lines in there because every time we implement a project, you know, I have to work um, very cohesively with the executive level leadership to make sure that under any circumstance for an accrediting or regulatory compliance, that this program does not create any uh, issues to adherence. And so I can send what CMS says and what the Joint Commission says. HFAP, um, the Health Facilities Accreditation Program, has some um, criteria in their primary stroke center accreditation and some of their generalist type uh, rules, but it all cross walks back to CMS and conditions of, of participation. And I don't know, Becky, do you have anything to add in that genre? Yeah. No, I would just echo it. Um, so our next question is about billing for services. So under the TENP grant, are you billing for your services? So unfortunately, we are not uh, billing for services, and that has really nothing to do with the grant itself. Um, because we have a, a very broad range of telehealth billing uh, rules, if you will, that span between Indiana Medicaid to Medicare and then the commercials, um, it is a very difficult, um, it's very difficult to navigate. So we have thought about the end of the beginning and we have contracts that exist between the provider 
group and the facility in which those consults are occurring and those facilities within their operational budget and they've they've integrated this into operational budget for the past five years pay a flat fee for the case we know on average that one critical access hospital will generate about a hundred telebehavioral health consults per year and so then that money then goes back contractually to the behavioral health center as the grant uh, organizer here, we're just facilitating relationships and um, solutions through the telehealth piece and engaging partners to help contribute to the data so that we can make better informed decisions. And I wanna also lean on Beck, Becky here to maybe chat a little bit more about the disparities across the billing spectrum as it pertains to commercial Medicare and Medicaid and the challenges that that presents the billing entity. Yeah, um, for, and, and we have on our website, um, Omna, I don't think we captured the state that people are from, but on our website under resources and payers reimbursement for the four states that the Upper Midwest Telehealth Resource Center covers, we have state-specific reimbursement summaries, and there's also links to the Medicare um, telehealth codes and, and to the, um, under the policy section, to the Center for Connected Health Policies, 50 state uh, guideline on Medicaid policies all across the nation. And that's one of the most frequent questions we get is about billing and reimbursement. So we're happy to engage in individual discussions on, on those topics. Yeah, and so I don't know, some of you may want to also investigate the Accountable Care Organization Next Gen um, Initiative. There has been some, some um, waiver, if you will, that goes into that in terms of um, being able to bill for where a patient exists um, that is absent of the health professional shortage area and some of those stipulations. But I have not looked into it to the degree of absolute 100% certainty to be able to communicate it to a broader audience in terms, does this pertain to emergency-based care that we're talking about here today. I'm not exactly sure because some of that ACO next gen was built within the context in mind of chronic care management and readmission mitigation. And I don't know without doing more research myself and maybe putting some homework on our constituents here within the UMTRC to identify if emergency services would be covered in that next gen waiver yeah <laughs> i haven't dug into it that much and there's only i there's only a handful of organizations that are next gen across the country but here in indiana we do have two of them which is deaconess health and iu health mm -hmm. yeah uh, the next question is about cost reports, and have you heard of COS including the cost of telehealth in their cost reports? Yes, and they absolutely do. So um, I assist um, our accounting and finance department, at least I know of that, on the union health side of the equation and how the critical access hospitals integrate that into their cost reports, so absolutely they do. Uh, the next question is hardware and software. Um, what platform do you use? And how do you cover the expense of having that psychiatrist available? So it's always important from when we started with this and thinking about the cost absorptive cart models that we were um, exposed to. And it was just really overwhelming for me as a clinician to be able to think contextually around all of the technical aspects. But today we are upwardly mobile and we actually have a BA with uh, zoom.us, which is the same platform that we're on today, but I have got under my clinical umbrella that afford that has afforded me the adherence to the strict HIPAA confidentiality and patient protection um, that we need. And so in the emergency department settings that we utilize, um, we utilize now, we had carts, uh, timbre carts before, but now because it's consultative based, we use an iPad, which we do have on carts, but they are totally detachable. The patients can hold them, so it's more personable in this digital age. 
we're used to FaceTiming, we're used to having um, other types of um, social interactions via our phone in that context. And so if they want to be able to hold that to have a more personable and intimate reaction or relationship with their therapist that they're talking to at the time, then they can do that. Otherwise, it's on a cart and it just goes right in and I can, I'll see if I can find the carts that we utilize so that you can share that with them in terms of because they're very nice. Um, and then from the um, provider side, we can use anything because Zoom is agnostic. It can be a PC, it can be an iPhone, it can be an Android, it can be um, any type of device that would afford that, that provider to have the, the privacy aspects to assure that, you know, they're not doing a consult from an IHOP while they're eating breakfast. <laughs> So there are some policies and procedures that we have in place about appropriate use and, and, and patient protection of, of confidentiality as it pertains to telehealth space and just kind of those professional etiquette and those behaviors. From, a, um, from another specialty side, because, because behavioral health is more consultative and not diagnostic and that we don't need to use other tools to listen to lungs and sounds that the patient has um, in those particular settings uh, at the end point where the patient at is at we use Panasonic tough books which have detachable screens that look just like an iPad but they have USB ports on the side of them and they also have a keyboard for patient registration but when you detach that 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 screen and you have the the uh, the uh, USB port you also have afforded yourself the opportunity to include a digital stethoscope or any other type of peripheral device that that endpoint clinician would need to have to assess the patient. And likewise, the endpoint clinician would not have to have really anything special on his or her end other than the ability to maybe have some noise canceling headphones or earbuds to be able to hear those breath sounds or those heart tones or you know those belly sounds. And so um, we really try to make it as end user friendly because the easier it is for people to engage, the more they will engage. And you cannot get people driven to the adoption of a new technology when it doesn't work all the time, every time you pick it up, or there's poor quality. So we've really taken um, a really firm stance on making sure that it's end user friendly and high quality. In terms of the cost, we again, we afford those operational costs into the um, contracts between the critical access hospitals and the providers themselves. Um, typically what we have out in our model, at least in the critical access hospitals, is that we have masters prepared um, social workers and other types of LCMHs, licensed clinical mental health providers, that are at least assessing and collecting information in a standardized way it looks the same on every single patient, but they collect the information and then they staff that case with the psychiatrist. Because we have such a profound shortage of the psychiatrist, we have these middle leg providers, these, these extenders that are gathering and are facing with the patient. And if there is ever a question where an emergency room physician or a provider feels like that they need to directly interface with a psychiatrist, they can pop on. But for the most time, in, in general sessions, the LCMH or the master's prepared social worker or the licensed social worker gather the information and then they staff the case with the psychiatrist. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> well, we've got a couple more minutes. We'll see if anybody else has any questions. But I want to thank you so much, Stephanie. You guys have been true pioneers in the state of Indiana for what you guys, the trails that you have blazed. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty exciting. And, you know, it's really hard to think about where we were when, when our paths first intersected, Becky, and you were really working with the FCC piece and all of that, mm -hmm. and to think where we've come today in terms of the thousands and thousands of patients that have been afforded access and availability to specialized healthcare because of these efforts, mm -hmm. it's tremendous. Because at the end of the day, that's why we do what we do. It's about yeah. patients. Yes, it is. Got another billing question here. Billing of Medicare for the counselors. Now, um, you, the folks that you use for telepsych are psychiatrists, correct? 
So, so in our model with the Community Mental Health Center, we have the LCSWs, the MSWs, the LCMHs that are doing the information gathering, and then that's staff with psychiatrists. But I want to reiterate that there is no bill professionally that is being generated on behalf of that entity to that patient. All of the sustainability that we currently have, and I'm not saying it's the right way, it's not the one shoe that fits all sizes for, for, for pity sakes, it is the rule that has worked well collaboratively between our hospital administrators and the administrators of the Community Mental Health Center to pay that flat rate fee back and forth across the, the equation. So we do not bill on either side um, for the, the patient's experience uh, or professional fee. And then from the emergency department, that just figures into their level charge. Yeah, I'm pulling up the fact sheet right now. Um, I'm gonna, it sounds like we might have some people on the phone. Can you mute them? I'm getting some feedback. Um, let me just pull this up real quick. I can't remember off the top of my head if LCSWs are reimbursed by Medicare. Here we go. Yeah. Pediatric diagnostic interview examinations. Uh, so it's limited right now for Medicare, specific to Medicare, physicians, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, nurse midwives, clinical nurse specialists, and certified registered nurse anesthetists. So you have to be a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's what I, so, so I think that, you know, it would behoove us to also probably talk to you know, our community mental health centers and such, because they really assigned a high value to the ability for their mid-level, not technically in the mid-level sense, but that that middle range of the LCS master's prepared or LCMH to do the interface, the triage basically, and the staffing of the case with the psychiatrist and the psychiatrist then to engage. And then they, they basically are the handlers because with the profound shortage that we are experiencing with psychiatrists, this was one of the ways giving the emergency service hot on demand type product that we were working within. We have to think about the quality of work-life balance for the psychiatrists and the ability to retain them in our system. And, and so that is the way that, and now the psychiatrist is credentialed at the facility in which that report's going back to that he or she has authenticated and said, this is my consultant opinion. It is still up to the emergency room physician to activate or engage the consultation um, that has been provided in that feedback. Yeah, so this person is trying to understand the, the psychiatrist, they, I think they all get paid, in, in your model, all of the caregivers get paid, but they get paid out of general fund from the hospital or the critical uh, access they hospital. They get paid order. contractually, not via billing. Right. Contractually. But psychiatrists would be the only one that is eligible for reimbursement via billing from Medicare. If they so chose to bill via Medicare and the conditions of the originating site were eligible to be a Medicare billing site, mm -hmm. which that then gets into a whole other conversation about does it fall outside of a metropolitan statistical, statistical area, it has to have certain conditions mm -hmm. for the critical access hospital in this instance mm -hmm. to even be a qualified site. Mm -hmm. Even though they're critical access hospital, they may not qualify as a Medicare site to bill mm -hmm. that originating site fee. Yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and put this link in the chat here. Um, to the Medicare um, telehealth fact sheet. And it, it lists everything, all the conditions that we were just mm -hmm. talking about. And we just found it to be so much more um, 
simpler to run contracts versus try to keep up with all the billing um, code changes and the nuances with each different payer. And then up until this past year, Indiana and Medicaid had mileage limits in their Medicaid. And so from anybody who does billing, you really risk something falling through the cracks from a compliance perspective if you're not doing it the same, you know. So it has just been one of those challenges, I think, and Becky, please chime in here, that's been very, it's been a moving target for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. All right, Amna, I think we're ready to hand it back to you. All right, thank you so much, Stephanie, for such a comprehensive overview of your project and for answering all those questions, and Becky for moderating the question and answer session. This webinar will be available at the UMTRC YouTube channel, and I would also be sending out Stephanie's slides and some additional information that she mentioned. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, even after we are done, don't hesitate to call, contact Becky and me and Stephanie and the information that she provided. And thank you so much. Thanks everyone. Thank you everybody. Thank you.